renovated retirement with charlie jewett oh no i think i'm about to have another episode hey everybody charlie jewett with renovating retirement episode 127 talk nerdy timmy i don't know if that was any good it wasn't, it wasn't even close was it <laughs> now, jason derulo does it better than me i don't know how to do that so this is talk nerdy to me with Abby Duane, yes. Now, most of you, if you call in and uh, get help from our company, you eventually end up talking to Abby. Abby, you're the one at a meeting with clients and uh, giving them the best retirement plan in the, in the universe, in the known world, right? Absolutely. Maybe the best retirement plan on all planets. Yes. I don't think anybody on Mars or anywhere else is, is beating us at this point. Not even close. Not even close. So what we want to do on this episode is get a little nerdy, go inside of some of these products, particularly... Uh, what are called indexed strategies. So indexed annuities, indexed universal life insurance. Now it's, it's, you know, I don't know how my car works, so we don't have to get nerdy with everything. Um, I just turn my car on, I drive it and I'm fine with that. I don't know anything about the carburetor or the blah, 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 you know, uh, the mechanics can do all that. But some people like to understand how their car works and they do. But I do want to talk a bit about um, the internal workings of indexed strategies like annuities and life insurance because they've changed pretty dramatically and I'm I will give you a chance to talk Abby but I'm going to do an intro first does that, does that sound fair yeah go right ahead so you know when I started this industry 14 years ago basically the only index that any of these annuities or life insurance used was the S&P 500 which is which is great kind of the granddaddy of all indices that's a cool word right and the way it worked was you buy an annuity, let's say, and they say if the market goes up, you get the first 7 or 8%, and that's called a cap, which we'll talk about. So the first 7 or 8% you get, so if the market went up 15, you only get 7, let's say. And when the market went down, you didn't lose a penny. So that was kind of awesome. It was like a way of having some of the gains, none of the losses, so you completely avoid all of the bear markets, all the times the market crashes, and they were great. Well, the S&P 500 index and those caps over the time I've been in the industry from 2005 till now just went down, 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 down. Some of those, I don't know what they're at today, Abby, but some of those are down to like two and 3%, right? Absolutely. So why would anybody, I mean, we're not using that, of course. Why would anybody, you know, put money into a product and say, when the market goes up 20, I get two or three. When it goes down, I get zero you're going to bounce between zero and two or three. There's no way to average even enough to keep up with inflation. So we're not using that S and P you know, cap strategy anymore. Well, thank, thank God the insurance companies that provide these products have had the intelligence and forethought to go out and create other indexes, right? So every index, every, I don't know if you take a crazy index like Morgan Stanley dynamic allocation or Barclays or, uh, what's the one? Janus. Uh, Prism, Janus, right? Yeah. All of those are just different measurements of the same stocks that make up the market anyway. They may be marketing these 40 or these 127 instead of the S&P 500 or just uh, looking at the S&P 500 a different way. Sometimes they do that. So they're basically measuring, you know, all we need in index returns or index strategies, all we need is something that goes up and down. Because when you go down, you don't lose. When you go up, you make money. So a lot has changed, which is why we're doing this, this episode, uh, Talk Nerdy to Me. Because today's, what are called crediting strategies, are kind of awesome. Like, even better than when I started, they're, they're kind of awesome. You can make a whole lot more than 7 or 8% in some of these. So what, just as a, before we even get into this, um, Abby, I've got here that you're, you're like a total nerd. And it's not an insult. You know I'm saying? <laughs> like, every, like, from the time that... I met you, basically everything you ever like get into, you go and figure it out, you master it. Uh, most of you don't know that Abby changed the brakes on my car when she was pregnant, which is just crazy. It was awesome. It was <laughs> so much more God. manly than me. So you make dresses, you did the mortgage industry, right? you cut hair, you mastered, fin what is it? Have you always been like that? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> what kind of grades Curious? did you get? Uh, very good grades. Very good grades. So you got good grades, nerd. Yeah, and I then know. What was your first job out of, uh, I don't know, high school or college? Sales. So you went right into sales. Yep. And, and sales isn't a bad that. word. My definition of sales is helping people know what they should do, which is the easy part, and then helping them to do what they should do, which is the hard part. Yes. So basically enlightening people and then providing leadership for them to 
do something good in their life. Not used car sales where you're ripping somebody off, but no. leadership, right? <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Okay. Uh, after yeah. that, I got into the mortgage industry. So. so you were in the mortgage industry like myself, like Ian Grove, who's did, we did an episode with Ian Grove called In the Trenches. So Ian works with us. I work here, obviously. You work here. We were all in the mortgage industry. Uh, did very well, right? Mm-hmm. There are some similarities, right? Although Absolutely. we all kind of like this industry better. But um, so, so why don't you talk about that a little bit? What was your history in the mortgage industry or real estate mortgages and kind of financial services before you met me? Um, I did loans, both conventional and unconventional. We did construction loans. Uh, we had a commercial branch and also a residential branch. Um, we did the bridge loans, all sorts of different stuff when we got creative with our financing offerings. Yeah. So when you came and learned my strategies and listened to the podcast and things like that, the sort of the home equity planning piece of this probably made more sense to you than most people, right? It was a whole new world. <laughs> I'm about to sing an Aladdin song, but I won't even try it. <laughs> not even, I, I sing on the podcast, but I'm not doing that one. So that whole, I mean, most people say pay off your mortgage, interest is bad, blah, 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 blah. In our firm, we tend to think, no, if you can pay like three or 4% tax deductible, and keep your money making the kind of returns that we're about to talk about, why not create that arbitrage? Why not continue to employ home equity at three, four, five percent to try to make six, seven, eight percent? Right. And that makes sense to you, right? Absolutely. All day long. So what um, you know, let's like nerd out a bit on these on these crediting strategies. It used to be, you know, it used to be pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and push up my glasses right now with my index finger and like, and, uh, you know, grab a pen out of my pocket protector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Remember Revenge of the Nerds? Those movies? Those were awesome. <laughs> Love those. Here's the basics in the world of, of crediting. And what we mean by crediting is how you're earning interest. If you're in the stock market, which, by the way, folks, we're not against the stock market. From 1970 to 1999, the stock market averaged about, even if you do the real rate of return, not the fake one that your joker broker uses, if you look at the real rate of return, Kager compound annual growth rate, it was like 13.78, which is ridiculously high. So risk, you know, more risk did equal more reward. And that's awesome. Awesome sauce. We love that. The problem is nobody cares about the weather from the seventies. Nobody cares about traffic reports from the eighties. And I don't care what the market did in, you know, 40, 50 years ago. The last 18 years, from the year 2000 until now, where we've had two of the biggest crashes we've had, you know, 2000, 2000 2001 crash, dot-com bubble, and then the mortgage meltdown in 2008-9, from 2000 until now, the market's only made about 5.5% for you before fees. And I understand that most of you, you know, Abby and I are the ones reviewing these statements when you bring them in. Most of you are paying fees of, you know, half a percent, one percent, two percent to a broker. So if the market's only paying five and a half, brokers do worse than the market anyway. So you're down to five or four and a half. And then there's a fee of one percent. You know, making three or four percent is not worth the risk of the market. So insurance companies came out with these other strategies called index strategies. Market goes down, you don't lose anything, market goes up. You make some of it. How much? How do they calculate the sum of it that you make? So there's really three different options. One is, is a cap. So I'm, I'm in a room right now. I don't know. The ceilings are probably like eight feet. I'm a, you know, traditional sort of like stereotypical white dude. I couldn't jump up and hit my head if I, if I tried. But if I was like really good at jumping, well, like Abby's boyfriend, like Sonny could probably jump through the roof and, and, and like Superman, right? <laughs> Maybe not now. Was that only in his 20s and 30s? <laughs> Before all the knee injuries. After pre pre knee injuries. Has he had <laughs> surgery yet? Uh yes, he has. It was like a piece of bone floating around in there. What was it again? Yeah, it was a cyclops. Uh Cyclops. Yeah, that's what they called it. It he was a cyclops piece of bone. <laughs> Pretty much. It was a one eyed <laughs> bone. One eyed piece of bone in there? It was the size of a marble. And the doctor took it out. And of of course I wanted to keep it as a souvenir, but the doctor discarded it before we got a chance. <laughs> Well, you have it like a necklace and you wear it around your neck and <laughs> cyclops you a bone. I wish. <laughs> so if I could jump really high, I would jump inside this room, but there's a ceiling that would stop me. And that's a cap. That's how you understand a cap. So 
one year at a time. Usually most of these strategies are one year at a time. Sometimes there's two or three years, but they measure, you know, it's called an annual point to point, January 1st or January 1st or whenever you buy it, June 30th, to June 30th, whatever it is. They say, where's the market? They wait one year. Next year, they look at where is the market now? If it's up, a cap works like this. You get the first X percentage. You get the first three, the first five, the first 11. So a lot of index insurance, index universal life insurance policies, Abby, still have a cap of, you know, like what, 10, 11 and a half percent for that yep. kind of annual point to point, right? Absolutely. Annuities, not so much. If you're on the S&P 500, they're going to be like 3%, 4%. They're pretty, pretty nasty. Mm -hmm. So we don't really do a cap strategy on most annuities. So that's a cap. It's probably the easiest one to understand. The first piece goes to you. Everything after that, you don't get. It's not really the insurance company that keeps it. It's an option buyer, but don't worry about that. The first 7% goes to you or the first 11, and then you don't get anything else. So that's a cap, a ceiling. There are some spread strategies, or some, some people call this margin, and I don't mean to be super technical. I just want you guys to understand this. Margin or spread is exactly the opposite of a cap. It's a first piece that goes to someone else and you get everything else. So this is kind of the first part of, or one of the ways we get people unlimited upside potential, right, Abby? Mm -hmm. So if the market goes up, you know, there's some strategies that say if the market goes up 20, 30%, you have to pay someone three and a half percent spread. Now it's not a fee. When the market goes down, you're not paying three and a half. So it's not like the fees in a variable annuity or the fees on a, on a, you know, portfolio of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It's not charged every year. It just says, Hey guys, when there's a profit, we get the first 3.5 or whatever it is and you get everything else. So if the market goes up 5% and they get 3.5, you get one and a half percent. That's not a great year, but what it creates and you don't get from a cap strategy because a cap has a ceiling. What it creates is unlimited upside potential. So we have we have in our, uh, in our server, Abby, you, you've seen this, the whole history of the S&P 500. There are some years, particularly after a crash, where the market jumps up 30 40%, right? Mm -hmm. A spread strategy is going to capture most of that for our clients. And that's one of the ways we've done so well is say, let's protect against losses, but put you in a situation where if the right things happen, if we get one of these pops in the market, you can make a ton of money. And, and we've seen this, I think you and I have seen, um, we had a, an episode called what the heck is a mech talking about modified downlink contracts and we'll do one in the future. We're going to do a check yourself before you make yourself, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> We're talking about mechs again, but we use mechs for in case accounts or, you know, there's no, there's no fees. There's no penalties to quit. You put the money into an insurance company instead of a bank and it has a lot of upside potential and no downside risk and no fees if you want to quit. So it's basically a way of taking liquid money and not, not restricting it to only make, you know, one or 2%, whatever banks pay. We've seen people, I don't know what our record is. Is it like 23% in a year? 23. Like that that is, is correct. So mm -hmm. actual statements that have come back where because of a spread strategy or I think it was actually a monthly, monthly cap in that case, but same idea of putting someone in a situation where if the right things happen, they can make a lot of money and the right things happened for 12 months and they made 23%, right? Mm -hmm. so that spreads. Sorry, my introduction is so long. We'll get, we'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing, uh, so we have caps, which is a ceiling. We have spreads, which is the first part goes to them. You get everything else. And then we have what are called participation rates, which may actually be the easiest one to understand because it's kind of like, you know, I own this company free. I, I mean, I own this company I'm the only owner. There's no partner. But if I had a partner, 50-50, and profits came in, so we got paid, and we paid all our employees and all our bills, and we go, what are the net profits? And they were $100,000. $50,000 goes to my partner. $50,000 goes to me because we're in a partnership. That's what a participation rate is, is what percentage do you get? So some of the newer products that Abby and I are really liking right now have participation rate crediting strategies where they say, okay, if the market goes up 10%, you get 70% of it. So market goes up 10, you get seven. However, Abby, you've actually found some products where they're actually paying more than a hundred percent. So if the market goes up 10, you might make 11 or 12. Is that right? That's right. 
Now, how they're doing that behind the scenes, the way they're doing their pricing, because they're really buying options, the way, the way that these insurance companies do this, they're buying, taking a little bit of your money and buying options in the market, how they're doing all that, you know, we don't know all the inner workings, but the participation rate says you get 50, like for instance, one of my favorite strategies, and if you go to uh, charliespictures.com, you can see I put up there from 2000 to 2017 that an indexed annuity would have beat the market, even if you could find a way to buy the market with no fees, which you can't, from 2000 to 2017, if you used an indexed annuity with a 50% participation rate, meaning when the market went up, you got half of whatever it did every year. So it went up 20, you got 10, went up five, you got two and a half. However, when it went down, you didn't lose anything. There's that floor, that 0% floor. I actually proved in that picture at charliespictures.com that you'd have 38% more money in your account with the annuity. So basically half the ups and none of the downs are better than all the ups and all the downs. Risk is not worth it right now over the last 17, 18 years. But that's a 50% crediting strategy, 50% participation rate. Talk to me a little bit, Abby, about what you're seeing, particularly in the indexed universal life insurance world with creativity or sort of innovation in participation rates or crediting strategies from some of these companies. Oh, absolutely. Um, so there's actually multiple moving parts in addition to the uh, participation rates that make some of these very appealing. Um, one of them would be an over 100% allocation rate, meaning if you were to have 135% in any particular index offering that they may have, which in this case, the one I'm referring to is the PRISM, you would be credited on 135% of the money. In addition to the 135%, there's also a 105% participation rate. Um, so, so let me stop if, you there for a second. So if somebody puts a 10 grand in, or maybe we use like 10 grand is pretty small. Let's say $100,000, right? Somebody has $100,000 of premium they put into one of these non-stock market strategies, right? Mm -hmm. And the 135%, the, the insurance company is basically going to like, call it $135,000. They That's only put right. in a hundred grand, but they're basically going to pretend it's 135,000, right? Correct. Then if that 135,000 or if the market, the index, they're the prism, right? The index they're looking at, if that index, whatever they're tracking, if the index goes up 10%, it's 10% of 135,000. So they basically make like 13 and a half grand, right? And then you're saying, but it's not, just, it's not just that, but it's 105% of that. It's a little more than 13 and a half. It's 5% more than that, right? And here's where we begin to sound like an infomercial. But wait. But there's wait, more. there's <laughs> more. Buy now and you get two. <laughs> yes, that's right. I believe I'm going to need a calculator. I'm, I'm now going to open the calculator on my computer. Yeah. In addition to the 105% participation rate, they're also going to go ahead and give you a 30% multiplier. And when does that come into play? And I understand, listeners, this is complicated. This is the inner workings of a, of a car engine, you know, how the spark plugs work and the carburetor and all that. But I just want you guys to know that this exists and how we're getting the type of results. I mean, I'm at two and a half years, Abby. I'm at two and a half years of challenging any financial advisor in the country to debate me that annuities and life insurance beat the stock market, that less risk and no fees sometimes makes more money than risk with a side of fees. And you know, working at the company, how many people have been willing to debate me in the last two and a half years? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero people. I mean, Michael Jordan during his heyday, or maybe today somebody like LeBron James or whatever, if you challenge them to a game of one-on-one, -on -one, they're excited. Michael Jordan would stick his tongue out and dunk on you because he knew he was the best, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that financial advisors cower away from showing that they know what they're talking about because basically most of them know that they're wrong, know that they're lying and don't want to be embarrassed. So I know this is a little complicated, but I want you guys to understand how we're getting the types of results that we're getting and why these things beat the stock market. I'm going to do an episode and probably write a book called financial planners don't beat the market, but financial plans do. And the idea is that financial products, things like we're talking about here that earn off of market returns, but don't take the losses, have done better than the market itself. So 
30% multiplier, when does that come into play? So I've got like, I have the, I have the calculator out. I say we put in a hundred grand, they call it 135,000. The market goes up 10%. So we're supposed to make 13.5. However, that gets multiplied by 105%. Is that right? Correct. So now we're up to 14.175. And what's this 30% thing? Is it, is it multiplied by 1.3 or where's that come into play? Yes. It would now be we, times 130. Okay. So we times that by 130%. So we just made $18,427 on a hundred grand. That's like 18 and a half percent when the market that went up correct. 10. And somehow, I don't know that I understand this. I'm not saying that you do. Somehow the insurance company is still making money too, right? Correct. Uh, the way they buy the options or whatever. But if the market, if you can make 18 and a half percent when the market goes up 10% and then when the market goes down, there are no losses. Guys, investing is all about probabilities. Understand? What's the most probable thing to happen? And I'm telling you, and Abby knows this, in our firm, we believe the most probable thing that's going to happen in the market is that wherever it goes, it's going to go there by going up and down and bouncing around. The one and only thing we really bet on and believe in is volatility. Isn't that right, Abby? Absolutely. I don't know if the, if the S&P 500 is going to go up to 3,500 or 30, you know, it's at, I don't know where it's at today, but it's had some, you know, it's been crashing. It was at 2,700, 2,800. It's been crashing. I don't know where it's going to go. I just know because of my two and a half years of trading foreign currencies, that every single chart, the one minute chart, the five minute chart, the one day chart, the one week chart, the one month, the way the market moves is in an A, B, C, D pattern. It zigzags wherever it goes. And we make our money on the zigzags because when it's a down year, you don't lose. And that sets you up for more growth and an up year you earn. And if you can make 18 and a half percent when it moves up 10%, that's even better. Right, Abby? Oh yes, Absolutely. So we love that strategy right now. Is there anything else out there that's kind of innovative? Or don't we have one company? I mean, the basic idea of indexed annuities and indexed universal life insurance is you give an insurance company some money, you know, hundred grand, they put it into their general fund of bonds or whatever, some real estate, you know, loans on strip malls and things like that. But most of it is bonds, AAA rated bonds, government bonds. They make five or 6%. They keep one or two for themselves. And then there's three or 4% left. That's why whole life pays three or 4%. That's why uh, fixed universal life pays three or 4%. That's why fixed annuities, five or 10 year annuities have averaged around, you know, three and a half percent right now. Mm -hmm. The company's making five or six. They keep some, they give us three or four, right? The whole like revolution, the miracle of indexed annuities and indexed universal life insurance 20, 30 years ago, somebody said, why don't we take that three or 4% that the client's getting and buy options? basically buy call options on a market, the S&P or the Prism or whatever. Let's just, let's just say, you know, somebody has a hundred grand, the insurance company invests their money and makes six grand. They keep two grand for themselves. There's four grand left for the consumer, Abby. And you can either have it if you had whole life or fixed universal life or whatever, or buy an index product like we suggest. And they buy options on a market that it's going to go up. When it goes down, you lose all of it. You lose the entire four grand, but you didn't lose in your principal. That's why we have a 0% floor. Does that make sense? Don't we have some products or some innovative companies now that are saying, you know what? Instead of just using that 4%, you can actually pay an extra fee. You can yes. give us more money. We'll actually, if you want us to, we'll mm -hmm. take some of the principal, some of the hundred grand and buy more options. So you have more upside potential. That's happening now, right? That is correct. And this is important to me because I'm working on setting up our own registered investment advisory firm, setting up our own money management because I don't want to be a joker broker. I don't want to be one of these guys that underperforms the market by spreading people around, faking like you're diversified, knowing that the S&P 500 does better than 95% of the money managers. I don't want to be that, but I have looked at for myself and eventually for clients, why don't we risk 5% a year doing exactly what the insurance companies do? Buy options with 5% of your account. Oh my gosh, it went down. Spend another 5%. Oh my gosh, it went down. Spend another 5%. The longest downtime we've ever seen in the last like 65 years is three in a row. So we'd be down 15%. Say it's down five years. We're down 25%. That's still not even like 2008, which was down you know, 38% in one year. 
Mm-hmm. So if something that's never happened before, market goes down five years in a row, we're only down 5%. However, when the market goes up, if you spent 5% of your account on options, you'd make a killing. So we're trying to set that up and don't have that. And that's why I'm excited about this because the insurance companies are kind of offering something along those lines, which is paying an extra fee. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, the extra fee is actually rather conservative when you look at what you have to gain. Um, So that last index that we're discussing, um, that one does come with an annual segment charge of Mm 1.5. But what they're giving you in exchange for that 1.5 is that 30% multiplier. So Ah, I see. So mm -hmm. if you pay the extra fee, give them more money for options, they're adding that extra 30% boost, right? Mm-hmm. That's but in correct. The down years, it doesn't cost you anything. It's still, well, it just costs you the fee, right? Yep, that's right. That 1.5. So really, the most important thing for people to look at is, and this is what I did in the beginning of my career when I heard, oh, when the market goes down, you don't lose. When the market goes up, you make, you make some of it. Naturally, my first question was, well, how often is the market down? And how often is it up? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, is it flipping a coin? You know? And I found that two or three out of every 10 years, the market's down, but seven or eight out of every 10 years, it's up, right? That's correct. And that's where we make our money. So where do you see the highest upside potential between kind of caps, spreads, participation rates? What, what products, are not, not, not by name, but what strategies do you see are showing, you know, hey, if you bought this thing 20, 30 years ago, you'd have made the most money? Oh, without a doubt, something that's got the advantage of having an index multiplier on it, um, that that's tremendously powerful. You're paying a small portion more for a huge amount of upside potential in exchange. Um, 30% is on that 135% of the money that you've got there. And then you're getting 105% of that. So the upside potential is definitely worth that 1.5 fee. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I've been looking for ways to pay fees like that because it's not necessarily a fee. It's an investment, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm betting on volatility, meaning the thing that I believe in, which is true, this is, this is what our firm believes in. We believe in the volatility of the market because it's based on humans, greed and fear, right? I do not think the market will ever go steadily down, steadily up without bouncing around because humans are always involved and that's not going to change after 65 years and you know more than that of measuring the market. If the market's going to bounce around, we want to benefit from, from that bouncing and why not have multipliers on there? And this, it sounds like this strategy has three multipliers, the 135%, the 105% and then the 30% extra, right? Yes. Yes. And that's um, how, you know, we're doing a lot of this right now for people, at least in the, in the cash value life insurance world. Cause how about the annuity world? What's going on in the annuity world? Does anybody have that come out yet for annuities? Not exactly that. Um, there is some versions of that where you can pay a segment or a, uh, a spread and you can get uh, the unlimited upside potential. Um, as far as multipliers, there are some products that are 120% participating or 150%, 160%. Uh, Typically, those are in exchange for a longer time period commitment for reset. Um, So in order to go north of 100% participating, you're normally locked into a two-year crediting strategy. And in order to go north of 120% participation, you're locked into a three-year crediting strategy. And the crediting strategy is just the method in which you're going to choose to make gains inside of your index product. Yeah, and those those one, two, and three year, we'll talk about that a little bit. A, a one year, you know, most annuities, kind of the the granddaddy or the original in the industry was the one year point to point where nothing happens throughout the year. You're not getting statements like you do from a brokerage account. Just on your anniversary, you get a statement that says, did the market go up or down? If it went up, well, if it went down, you make zero. If it went up, how much did it go up? And you get your cap or your spread or your, you know, they do the calculations on how much you earned. Well, what we've seen, um, in the last five or 10 years, some companies have come out with ways for you to make more money if you can have patience. And it's not necessarily comfortable. I don't think it's very comfortable for everybody, but if you can wait two years or three years, and why do I say it's not comfortable? Imagine a three-year strategy where you have a ton of upside potential, but over the first three years, first you're waiting three years to see if you made any money, 
and then the market's down over the three-year period. So you waited three years and you make zero. Mm -hmm. What if there's a fee? You know, what if you're paying an extra fee to buy more options and you're actually down money over three years, right, Abby? Oh, yeah. Then you wait another three years to see if you made money again. Forget whether it's up or down. Waiting six years to make your first dollar in any investment is not necessarily emotionally comfortable. However, I mean, there's plenty of six-year periods or five or six-year periods where the market's down in the market, right? If it's long-term money and it gives you more upside potential, somebody might do better that way. But I remember, now that you're meeting most of the clients, you can tell me what you think, but I think that people are most comfortable with one- and two-year strategies. Are you seeing the same thing? Correct. Yeah, yes. kind of the one, two-year. There was one company that had a five-year strategy. I'm like, are you mm-hmm. You can, yeah. <laughs> right, you gotta wait five years, it's down, you wait, you wait 10 years before you see if you make any money. And it had a lot of upside potential, but it's just not, not tolerable, yeah. <laughs> right? So Absolutely. in that one and two year strategy world, we do a lot of business with those, right? Mm-hmm. That we do. So when somebody calls in from the show, which happens you know, every week, somebody reaches out and says, I'd like to have some help. I've listened to X amount of shows. Can you guys protect me? And we're like, yes, amen. That's why we do this. Most of those guys talk to me a little bit and then they end up working with you on case design. I want people to know, like, are you like a hardcore used car salesman, high pressure or what's your approach to helping people? No, not at all. We just (laughs) like to show data and facts and let people sort of be in the driver's seat and make their own decisions. We just want to give them the truth and let them decide on what they want to do. We're just helpful nerds. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, I always tell people, always tell people like calling our company, like, yes, we're in the sales business. Yes, we're, we run a, a company that like everybody else, you know, earns commissions and everything, but we just approach it differently. With us, it's like having a friend in the industry. And that's because of my experience buying a car. I call it the Kelly story. When I went to buy my last car, I worked with a friend of mine named Kelly that had 12 years experience working in the finance department in the sales department of a, of a you know, car dealership. And she knew all the tricks. I mean, she knew everything that people do to try to raise the price or get you to pay too much or however the car, you know, I'm not a huge fan of like retail car sales methods, right? I hate buying cars. It's like not my favorite experience. I need to do it again soon and I'm I'm, I'm dreading it, but I'll just use Kelly again. Kelly called all the dealerships ahead of time, negotiated the price, found the company, you know, found the dealership. Even though I had one in my town, she found one 45 minutes away that had, you know, gave her a better deal. And then when I was there, they still tried to pull some crap and I put her on the phone and she set them straight. And I ended up with, I think, you know, three, $4,000 less on the price and, you know, three or $4,000 more for my trade-in. So on a car that I was buying, wasn't an elaborate, crazy, exotic car. I still have kids, you know, $6,000, five or $6,000 swing on a price for a normal car is a, is a lot as a percentage. Abby and I, what we are in the financial services industry is that just your friend in the industry to represent you as people try to pull the crap on you, try to rip you off, try to do it. You have to buy these things. You can't have, I mean, there's the do it yourself. Um, there's the do it yourself market and the do it yourself idea, which is fine. Stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. You don't need a broker, but when you go to buy life insurance or annuities, you have to work with somebody that has a license and so we carry those licenses and represent you in the industry to help protect you. Basically. Does that make sense, Abby? All day. Anything else you want to say to the amazing listeners that we have? <laughs> you put me on the spot, Charlie. <laughs> I know. What do you have to say to them? These are, these are our faithful, amazing <laughs> listeners, our future clients. Our loyal fans. Our loyal fans. Yep. <laughs> to, my, to my crazy antics. Awesome sauce. <laughs> um, let's see. How badly do you want to talk to them? If somebody's listening and they don't know if they have what's best or they're still in the market knowing that we're due for a crash, right? And that, that safer tools have done better than the market anyway, or they're going to retire and they don't have time. They, they, they can't recover from a crash, right? How badly do you want to talk to them? Pretty badly. <laughs> we want to save them from themselves. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's exactly what we're here to do. If you have illustrations from other companies or from another uh, agent or what have you, we welcome those and we'd gladly show you where there is room for improvement. Um, so that would be one thing that I would invite. And I put that out. I put an episode out recently called "Why You Should Use a Document Review Service," and we'll we'll do more of this. There's probably going to be some commercials on the uh, um, on the podcast coming soon about that. But you know, 
anything that anybody's going to buy in this industry, any annuity, any life insurance policy, anything they bought in the last one to five years, we will review those documents before you purchase to make sure that nothing funny is going on and you're getting the absolute best. And I mean, it's win, win, win for everybody. There's nothing bad that can happen. If you know that you're going to buy something for fixed income, guaranteed income, fixed returns, uh, death benefit coverage, tax-free growth inside of some sort of whole life or universal life policy, uh, rich man's Roth IRA, if you're buying anything in the annuity and life insurance world, we'll review those at no cost and you basically are guaranteed to get the best. And Abby, you're the one doing those reviews, right? Oh, yes. I mean, the absolute worst that could happen is you find out that you already have the best. Exactly. So the, I always say that to people, it's, it's, it's either good news or good news. We're going to pat you on the back and say, that's incredible. And honestly, if you did have something that was the best, we'd probably take the insurance agent or financial advisor that gave it to you and, and put them on the show and learn from them and make them one of our mentors because it's not what we find. So it's either good news, you have the best, or it's good news, we found something better. There's just no way to fail when you do it that way. Talk nerdy to me. <laughs> right? So we're a couple of nerds doing good in the world. If you need help, give us a call. You can get in touch at charlie at jewettwealth.com, C-H-A-R-L-I-E at J-E-W-E-T-T wealth.com, or give us a call on the 888 line, 888-285-2268. If you look up Charlie Jewett on Google, you'll find a whole bunch of ways to find me, watch charlie.com, the YouTube channel, listen to charlie.com, the uh, podcast, Learn from charlie.com. You can find my books for free. Not even charging for the books. What do you think of that? This is a huge value, right? All right, what do you want to say? Parting words. Let me talk nerdy to you. <laughs> <laughs> Please call in so Abby can talk nerdy to you. All right, guys, episode 127. Why do we do this? Because we think you people are the best. Renovate. Retirement. With Charlie G. But that's all, folks.